At this point, we've analyzed the bosses of Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, the Lovecraftian horror of Bloodborne and its chalices, and Sekiro's roster of memories and mini-bosses. But before we dive into the most recent installment, it's time to go back to the very beginning. Or at least to the remaster of the beginning, to the world of Demon's Souls. Not Demon Souls, by the way, it's Demon's Souls. In terms of boss order, Demon's Souls is potentially the single most open world game in the series. The first boss and the last boss are the only ones that have to be fought in order. So, the order I went through in my playthrough, and the one we're going to mimic here, is to do the first boss in each archstone, then the second in each, then end with the archdemons and their attempts to stick above the rest. Naturally, Archstone 1 will be a little bit strange, since it's a little differently paced with four bosses in there, but you'll see where those pop up. I should also mention that this is the only game in the series that I've only played once. Many of my opinions and analyses are based off of multiple builds and experiences throughout these games, but I've only played Demon's Souls and watched someone play Demon's Souls a total of one time each. And since I didn't really enjoy Demon's Souls' areas, potentially because I was in the remaster, I didn't immediately want to dive back in, but also wanted to make this video before I did Elden Ring. I've been seeing a lot of comments already about how the PS3 version is superior, and I have listened to the soundtrack and watched a lot of boss footage from the original version. Having not played it, there's only so much I can analyze while trying to stay impartial, but whenever a significant adjustment is made, I will try to make sure that I bring it up. The footage and music in this video, however, will mostly be from the PS5 version. So without further ado, let's begin our dive into Boletaria, and the world of Demon's Souls. When I mentioned the first and last boss fights were fought in a specific order, that wasn't counting Vanguard. Because Vanguard isn't a boss fight like the other fights in the game, or even like other fights in the series. He is here to kill you, not to be killed. Interestingly, despite this different design goal, the Vanguard's moveset is all but identical to the Asylum Demon in Dark Souls, a boss who is designed to be accessible, easy to defeat, and even empowering for new players. All that changed between the games was the damage dealt by the boss, the length that left hitboxes on screen on each attack, and its arena. The space where you find Vanguard is incredibly claustrophobic, particularly compared to the Asylum Demon's arena, meaning finding a safe place to recover is a challenge, especially to a player learning the game and its unique pace. The player becomes instantly trapped in a disadvantageous state the moment something goes wrong. There's nowhere you can really hide to heal as this thing lumbers towards you. When you combine that with the high damage he deals and weak starting healing options players begin with, it is an intentionally overwhelming battle, and I do love it for that. More than anything, I think the Vanguard demonstrates the power of numbers when it comes to boss design. The Vanguard's design, which once served to overwhelm and intimidate new players, just as easily can make a player feel empowered in the Asylum Demon battle. The simplicity of the moveset shines a lot in both of these fights. Slashes, slams, and a huge butt slam get off of me attack keeps either of them from ever becoming too complicated, while the less powerful Demon's Soul's role means that the Vanguard is more intimidating than the later variations. The Vanguard does appear as an enemy again in the Shrine of Storms, but its AI here ranks just above a potato. It doesn't like to walk into the main area, and I certainly wasn't going to run up to it while getting shot at by the stingrays I couldn't reach yet. So instead, it sat there and died while I shot it with plenty of space to spare. You re-encounter him early enough that he often poses more of a lethal risk than other bosses in the first level of each world, which are usually fairly tame. This brings me to one thing that Demon Souls' bosses stood out for compared to other games. The game almost begs to be cheesed. Exploits are easier to find, if not occasionally suggested to the player, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. In the case of Vanguard, it definitely hurts his rematch. My wife usually goes into these games using a sword, a shield, and medium armor. She doesn't use bows, she doesn't use magic, she's not about that. In her Demon Souls playthrough, however, without an additional push or suggestion from me, she was using bows, firebombs, and other consumable items to cheese or otherwise get the upper hand on the game. The Vanguard can be defeated in the first battle with it, and if you do so, you're rewarded with another buildup to the Dragon God, that huge beast, 
teased in the intro cutscene. We'll get to the Dragon God more when we get there, but this is an excellent piece of design. It serves as a beautiful little easter egg for veteran players, making them feel like masters of the game, while continuing to build towards a fun and exciting fight. Or at least what's supposed to be a fun and exciting fight, but we will get to the Dragon God when we get to the Dragon God. Overall, I'll give Vanguard a D-grade. Though he serves his role within the game, the less empowered role means fighting Vanguard doesn't have the same back and forth movement that his later variations within the series has. On top of that, his later rematch doesn't take place in a satisfying enough arena to feel like you've improved, instead encouraging you to make use of ranged options while his AI can't handle it. With that said, witnessing the birth of such an iconic moveset is absolutely incredible. As the Vanguard later evolved to appear in Dark Souls, Dark Souls 3, and even Elden Ring. He's just not a fun fight in this first game, but not as a failure of his moveset, more as a failure of placement. The Phalanx is the first real boss in the game that the player needs to defeat, and it stands as one of the most unique bosses in the series. It's more of an environmental puzzle than a mechanical test. Throughout the introductory area, the player receives piles upon piles of firebombs, and will have already been forced to fight the Phalanx enemies in tight corridors. This means that the player already knows that dealing damage to them is about finding a way behind them, or alternatively, making use of fire. Upon walking into the arena proper, they're confronted immediately with the puzzle of the fight made clear via that previous enemy introduction. These enemies, all but immune to damage from the front, are circling the true boss back to back. So, how do you break through? The solution in this is the aforementioned firebombs. The Phalanx walks a beautiful line. It moves slowly enough that new players can run to the other side of the arena and navigate their menu, while still providing enough damage up close prior to being broken up that a new player is forced to engage with the puzzle. Powering through it with standard attacks, especially this early on with no areas or leveling yet unlocked, is not something a player can reliably pull off. Somehow, the series' first puzzle fight ends up being one of its best ones. It's clear what the issue with the fight is due to the enemies being introduced prior to the fight, and the area showers you with more than enough supplies to manage a couple of attempts. And even if a player struggles enough that they run out, it's early enough in the game that you aren't completely screwed over if the worst comes to worst, and you need to restart. Even before Vanguard can be rematched, Phalanx also pushes towards finding those loopholes in creative ways to defang or take down later bosses. Demon Souls bosses are frequently designed around a weakness, and by forcing you to fight the boss with the most obvious one first, the game pushes towards encouraging constant creativity. Demon's Souls is not a fair game, and the game doesn't ask you to play fair either. I think the Phalanx earns a B grade. And though I can understand why bosses in these kind of games are rarely built around inventory usage, I wish we'd seen more bosses that make use of the inventory throughout the series, making items be more than a way to optimize the player character. With that said, I also didn't like Headless needing confetti to deal real damage, so it's a tough line to walk and I can see why it didn't reappear. You can technically beat the Phalanx without items, yes, but it is an incredibly unpleasant experience. The Tower Knight is one of the most iconic battles from Demon's Souls. It was the first fight I heard about from the game with the explosion of top 10 boss lists all those years ago. The cutscene the battle opens with, combined with the scale of the arena and focus on spectacle, laid the foundation for what would later evolve into the multi-phase battles we have today. Interestingly, Demon's Souls has, proportionally, more cutscenes than Dark Souls introducing bosses, and the archetypes of cutscenes that we see repeat throughout the series all began here. Tower Knight boasts the first big cutscenes many players will likely see in most FromSoft games, hyping the power of an early game boss to point out how far the player has already progressed. We see this same introduction cutscene strategy used in the Bell Gargoyles with the force they land on the roof, Gascoigne with his power as he turns around and immediately rushes, Vort with that huge scream, and even Margot with his anime-ass jump. Beyond that, though, it's odd to see what parts of his design survived over the years. The core of Tower Knight is that he attacks by slamming the ground and throwing his spear at range, but he moves incredibly slowly. He takes no real damage when you hit him, but if you attack his ankles enough, then the Tower Knight will collapse, allowing you to attack his head for the real damage in this fight. This element, of all things, ended up evolving into the Iron Golem Stagger and Trip, and, to a lesser degree, the Guardian Golems in Elden Ring. Hell, all of Elden Ring. 
Elden Ring in general put a larger focus on getting knockdowns for critical blows for all bosses. It's almost a universal trait. The Tower Knight is really the boss in Demon's Souls that started that off. It is the seed that evolved into what we see as the primary loop in Elden Ring. On top of that, the Tower Knight also has hordes of archers around him that will shoot at you in the open space. They aren't hard to take down, but the Tower Knight will throw his spear as you run, which ends up persevering into the One Reborn. I wasn't a fan of it then, and I'm not a super big fan of it now either, but it is significantly more welcome here. Demon Souls' boss fights are straightforward enough that many are more puzzled than boss, but that doesn't mean that running around and killing archers each attempt is any more fun. Unlike the One Reborn, these archers only serve an offensive role. There's no healing to outdamage here, which does mean that ignoring the archers doesn't require as much optimization. On top of that, the attacks the Tower Knight is performing of that spear throw are far easier to read by directing your camera than the One Reborn's flesh summoning attacks were in Bloodborne. I think the Tower Knight does still earn an A grade. Though it doesn't stick out nearly as much as later fellows in the grade, the Tower Knight feels like the source of so many pieces of From Software's game design. Their spectacle, their environment, even how they take damage. He needs to be honored as the grandfather of all of these tropes. On top of that, he's still a fun foe to take down, even if the moveset lacks a lot of the spectacle of later evolutions. One thing that I think is important to mention here is that Demon Souls' bosses are not as good as Elden Ring and Dark Souls 3 bosses. That doesn't mean they're less successful, though. Boss design has gone a long way since Demon Souls originally came out, and so a lot of these grades will feel a little bit strange. Sure, if Tower Knight was in Elden Ring, he'd probably only earn a B grade. But when you look at him in reference to the series as a whole, in terms of what he designs, in terms of what he introduces, he earns that higher grade. So if you're confused about any of the interesting grades I give here, that's probably the reason why. In a large majority of Demon Souls' boss fights, there's a simplistic pleasure to be gained from some of the more straightforward movesets within the battle. There's an honesty and weight to every attack that, though it may show its age, it remains satisfying and clear. One of the only exceptions to this, however, is the Armored Spider, who feels like a relic of aged boss design even when put against other bosses from the same game. Set in a thin mine shaft, the Armored Spider sits at the end of the hall and spits fire and webbing at the player as they try to reach the head to deal damage. Once you get in close, however, the spider uses a melee bite attack that poses a serious threat, one that eventually evolved into use with Freya and Estelle. After a moment, he'll spew oil all over the arena and ignite it, forcing you to sprint back down the mine shaft and beginning the whole process again. On top of that, the sides of the mine are covered in webbing. If you touch said webbing, it'll hold you in place, often getting you hit by a fireball or the oil ignition. The fight ends up having the player run back and forth, back and forth, landing pot shots on the head of the spider while avoiding the walls. But the melee threat it outputs in terms of melee means that there isn't a moment where the player starts to take control back. Because of this, the battle is more frustrating than fun. Did you move a couple steps too far to the side? You're webbed and now you're healing. Did you not correctly dodge or block the bite? Now he's spitting oil and you didn't damage him with this loop, try again. The loop just doesn't have enough engagement to be exciting. On top of that, the vulnerable section of the spider moves around enough that depth perception was a massive challenge here, leading to frustrating misses in an already frustrating encounter. I know everyone I've spoken to has agreed with me on this, but also everyone I've spoken to has only played the PlayStation 5 version. So it's possible that this bit wasn't an issue in the original PS3 release. The spider does have a great visual design, and the concept of a beast making use of the restrictive mind feels like an excellent concept for a boss. But there is a reason that other cyclical bosses, or bosses that can only be hit after you survive or overcome a set of attacks, haven't used the same restrictive space or aggression, often being more cinematic than not, such as the Divine Dragon. The environmental challenge takes away from the fight rather than supplementing it. I think the Armored Spider earns an F grade. There aren't many times where Demon Souls' contagious creativity fails, but the spider feels like one of those moments. The Fool's Idol is another boss whose concept was reused and repurposed multiple times throughout the series. You can see pieces of her design surviving in the Pinwheel and the Crystal Sage's clones, Gwendolyn's magical moveset, and even in the use of mobs in Gravelord Nido and a large number of the Elden Ring battles. 
She's got a much slower pace than the rest of the roster as well, which does a great job helping her stick out. The music here is also significantly more present in the remaster than the original, but successfully keeps the sparse, unsettling vibe the original had, while continuing to evolve the almost divine echo of the original with the new instrumentation. I really like the soundtrack use here because it helps make the slower pace stick out even more from the rest of the roster. Her introductory cutscene is particularly great, especially in the PS5 version. The scene and model look stunning here, and the light coming from the window makes for a great arena. Or at least I'd say it's a great arena if it weren't for my one issue with this fight being the invisible floor traps. There are so many places in this chapel where, if you step on it, you'll be frozen in place. With the damage that clones and the fool's idol herself can deal when you're frozen being as high as it is, this ends up incentivizing standing behind cover and whittling away at the idol when it gets too close, rather than chasing the mage around. The inclusion of these freezing pits actually kill a lot of potential fun with this encounter. The larger arena with more cover means the overwhelming feeling that pinwheel or crystal sages could have at low levels would have been avoided. It also makes the zombie mobs more engaging as you shepherd them behind pillars in order to fight them. As another layer of exciting design with said zombies, the zombies struggle to move around the pews in the center of the arena, which means that as you slowly clear the area, making it easier to navigate for yourself, all those enemies become more dangerous. There is so much here that feels close to incredible, and those freezing traps negate so much of it by stopping so much exploration. With that said, the experimentation in this fight makes it a great early game challenge. I have seen Fool's Idol get a lot of beef for personally being a little bit too easy, and yeah, she was on the easier side, but there's enough experimentation that it is a fun early game challenge. New players still aren't being intimidated away by the Fool's Idol, but there's enough to engage with the unique teleportation and pacing that they feel satisfied to come out on top. The freezing spots in the floor, however, stop it from being above average, but I think her design endured surprisingly well, earning a C grade. It actually made me more disappointed with Pinwheel too, considering the Fool's Idol felt more balanced in a game experimenting so significantly. Where the armored spider shows its age through design ideas that aged poorly, the adjudicator shows its age by being one of the simplest boss fights in the series. The adjudicator is… a robot that bleeds? He's a big man with a bird for a head? He's a dragon quest enemy that took a wrong turn and ended up in this pit somehow? Either way, he doesn't really match the aesthetic of the skeletons and stingrays of the area that came before, outside of his sinister chortling. To damage the Adjudicator, you have to attack his head, much like the Tower Knight. Unlike the Tower Knight, though, who indulges in that classic David and Goliath fantasy, to knock down the Adjudicator, you have to attack a big piece of metal stuck in his stomach. Somehow, this will cause him enough abdominal pain that he'll fall down and let you hit his head for a little while. Strangely, the Adjudicator falls forward onto the sword that was hurting it enough to make it fall down, which is a strange visual choice. The remaster here also lost a lot of the eeriness of the fight. In the PS3 version, the Adjudicator almost shines with his bright gold adding to the unsettling, out of place feeling, whereas the Adjudicator here feels so desaturated. I also think the increased intensity of the music in the remaster works against this boss a lot. In the original version, the soundtrack was slow, sparse, and built uncannily whereas the new version could easily fit under a bloodborne beast with the staccato violins and threatening cello, and it just doesn't match the Adjudicator's vibe. I think the Adjudicator more than anything is a proof of how well designed the Tower Knight was. The Tower Knight's moves are engaging and distinct, and the releasing air pressure on the ankles creates this believable trip moment while still making it clear why you aren't dealing real damage. The Adjudicator's moves are often hard to see and underwhelming, with the only one having any character being when he pulls out his tongue to attack. On top of that, the constant spraying of blood makes it feel bizarre that he isn't taking damage as you hit him. The restrictive space and relative size of the Adjudicator doesn't make it feel like you're felling a giant. It just doesn't have the same scale the Tower Knight does since it focuses more on trying to make the player uncomfortable. And yes, it is a little uncomfortable, but not uncomfortable enough to justify the limitations the fight has in comparison. The Adjudicator and Tower Knight are, in some ways, the same boss, but the Adjudicator made every wrong life decision where the Tower Knight succeeded. It does still earn a degrade, as it has a solid concept and works as an encounter, but the unengaging moveset and the way it lingers in Tower Knight's shadow keeps him from becoming notable. 
I'll be honest, out of every boss in the game, I have the least idea how you're supposed to fight the Leechmonger. There are only a few chaotic fights in Demon Souls, but even among them, this fight felt uniquely chaotic to me. The arena is a large pit, some areas slow down your movement, some ledges are too tall to walk over, and you need to travel down to face off against the Leechmonger. Within the fight itself, you'll get afflicted by leeches and need to worry about damage over time, the Leechmonger healing, attacking, exploding, and on the first playthrough, it was tough to ever tell what it was doing due to the amorphous shape. It should be mentioned you can fight it at range with magic or a bow, but a lot of times a lot of that focuses on trying to make sure it's in an attack loop to avoid it ever healing. In a vacuum, its moveset isn't too dangerous and the damage isn't insanely high, but when you combine it with the chaos of the arena and the conditions the arena and it inflict, the Leechmonger becomes one of the most stressful fights, at least on my first playthrough. From what I've seen, if you know what you're doing, the Leechmonger is absolutely bulldozed with any fire damage. But again, throughout the entire game, this was still the only fight that ever made me feel stressed out. I was always observing something new, being caught in a new corner, being afflicted by a status. The Leechmonger would start healing and I need to start being aggressive. There is so much happening throughout the fight that Leechmonger feels like one of the most complete modern bosses in Demon Souls even if the package itself isn't satisfying or fun to fight. Though I'm not a huge Leechmonger fan, and the fact that he can be so heavily bulldozed works against him, the chaos of conditions in Unique Arena earns him a high C grade. The sense of chaos and multitasking that Leechmonger introduced to the series evolved into really fun fights later on, with the intent of overwhelming the player almost certainly burrowing its way into the major boss fights in Elden Ring. The Flame Lurker is easily the fastest boss in Demon's Souls, often topping people's hardest and best boss lists. His introduction is huge, and the lighting within his arena sells you on the outright power of this demon. The original version has him burning out your eye sockets with how intent the light he's giving off is, while the remaster goes for a more understated but still excellent lava look. For the most part, I went through the Archstones doing the first boss of each, the second boss of each, and then ending with all the Grand Demon Souls. The Flame Lurker was the only boss I had to come back to. I could not beat him at the point I initially planned to go through the Archstones. If there's something I can agree with, it's that the Flame Lurker certainly earns the difficulty honorific. He's easily my choice for the hardest fight in the game by a pretty wide margin. But though I agree on the challenge the fight presents, Flame Lurker doesn't click for me in the same way that other battles did. Many of the design elements present here that I found frustrating aged incredibly well though. The speed of the Flame Lurker, for example, was kept in fights like Manus and Gwyn, two personal favorites of mine. They'll reach you faster than you can heal, and the aggression leaves little downtime. However, I don't like it in Flame Lurker because there's so few things you can do to create distance due to your lower movement speed. Unlike Manus, Flame Lurker often only swings once, so waiting to avoid a barrage of attacks to gain a moment to recover isn't an option. Combine that with lava on the ground causing chip damage, and his aggression feels excessive. He does have a significant weakness to magic, but he is capable of closing the gap so quickly that the only way to reliably hit ranged attacks is to get his AI stuck on something in his arena, letting you cheese the fight. That said, I wasn't here for that. I wanted to bite the bullet and fight him straight up, learning his moveset, however frustrating some of the moves occasionally were to dodge. The fundamentals of an iconic moveset, of one of the best movesets of the series, are there with the huge jumps in AoE burst and claw swipes that persisted into Bloodborne without even increasing in speed. But there is one reoccurring piece of design on almost every move that infuriated me, the singular thing in this fight that to me held it back. Whenever he hits the ground, there's a fire after effect wave that does a ton of damage, and rolling through both this and the attack is more precise than the already precise rolls Demon Souls requires. The effect here is that dodging the Flame Lurker ends up not being a matter of timing, but positioning to avoid the fire wave, occasionally getting a cheeky hit in if the opportunity happens to arise. It is possible shields might change how this interaction goes, so this might just be a lack of knowledge from only having one playthrough. And similar to other bosses I've talked about, I might just be missing some weakness that this opens up, some direct way that you can push through, roll through, to get in and punish these attacks. With that said, Demon Souls doesn't usually want you weaving in and out of attacks as much as later games in the series. The roll is intentionally far less powerful here than it is in even Dark Souls. Though most bosses are paced slower, allowing for a window to punish them after stepping back and using positioning to dodge, the Flame Lurker's speed clashes with the speed of the game and the player. 
I find Flame Lurker to be a hard boss to grade because if the moveset was copied one to one into Dark Souls 3's amplified mobility, Flame Lurker would stick out like the Dragon Slayer's armor. The base mechanics of an incredible battle are here, but that flame wave clashes with the pace of the game so much for me that I can't give it higher than a B grade. I know he's an often adored boss, but I personally just don't see it. Man Eaters are the Bell Gargoyles, but worse in almost every way. When the fight begins, there's one Man Eater. Once the Man Eater is at half health, or if you were too slow killing the first, a second Man Eater will spawn. Much like the Gargoyles, the fight isn't over until both are dead. The Man Eaters are the only duo boss fight in Demon's Souls, which makes this encounter the grandfather of every boss from Ornstein and Smo to the Godskin duo. And frankly, Compared to the rest of their later versions, it does not hold up well. Individually, the Man Eater's moveset is alright. They swipe, they charge, and they have some magic attacks that removing their tail gets rid of. It should be mentioned that this is one of the only dynamic moveset details that Demon Souls brushes against, and I really love dynamic movesets. Being able to take away some of their magic capabilities by targeting a specific part of their body is really fun. The issue is that the Man Eaters have two modes. Absolute Potato, or Combo God. They'll either do absolutely nothing and stroll around the arena while you can beat them senseless, or they'll time their attacks either individually or together to fling you off the tight arena more often than not. That same duality even extends for being in said arena in the first place. Sometimes they'll stay on the ground battling you normally. Sometimes they'll fly around the arena without a care in the world. Sometimes they'll fly around while casting spells. Sometimes they'll glitch and never come back. Though the low aggression of the man-eaters means that you usually don't have to worry about the two attacking you at once, it also makes the fight have a significant potential to drag out. As you're fighting two enemies at once, there's not enough space to fight them both on the tight bridge, which means when they both arrive, you end up often waiting until there's only one left. And moving to the middle platform, which is usually what you'd want to do in fights like the Iron Golem, confuses their AI, drawing the fight out even further. I've seen them stay up in the air for significantly longer just because I tried to move up to that middle section. As a result, the dual boss mechanic ends up either being frustrating or irrelevant due to the fix that they tried to apply to the battle, which isn't a great start to this particular genre of boss. There aren't moves like the Bell Gargoyle's breath weapons that create natural openings to attack, which makes the fight struggle to say satisfying. You can see that they learned a lot from this fight, even as early as Dark Souls. Though I give the Man-Eaters a hard time, the concept behind two flying beasts, with some of the only dynamic movesets in the game, rotating in and out of combat as one flies around and the other rushes you down, is great. But the fight doesn't fully execute on that concept as I'd like it to. More disappointingly, the remaster does nothing to solve it. The Man-Eaters earn a D grade. I wish that the idea had worked out, or that they managed to time the AI of the flight patterns in the remaster to finally deliver the boss's fascinating concept. But as it stands, it's an often boring battle that either gets steamrolled as they do nothing to stop you, or kills the player in frustrating situations. But where the Man-Eaters fail to deliver on a high concept battle, the old hero not only delivers on his concept, but has one of the better deliveries of a high concept battle in the series, which is saying something considering how early on this boss was designed. The old hero is blind, and when I say that, I mean it. His AI cannot see you. He only knows where to attack if he feels you attack him, or hears you moving around. If you're using the Thief Ring, that narrows it down even further, meaning he only attacks you once you attack him, or if you step in a couple of the puddles placed around the arena, a detail that creates such an exciting feel of tension and rewards utilizing items creatively again. The old hero's hitboxes are larger than they need to be, deal absurd amounts of damage, and last long enough that dodging is an issue with a limited roll. But unlike Flame Lurker, where that removed the best aspects of the design, the old hero is designed around getting in hits and then running away. So the sloppy attacks that deal a little bit too much damage sell the player on facing this boss as a stealth encounter. There are two bosses in Demon's Souls that try to sell you on the power of the boss by making them able to, or almost able, to one-shot you. This is the one that succeeds. The remaster's music also does a great job here, keeping the steady drum beat from the original, but adding in whispers and discordant strings underneath to amplify the musical dread present in that PS3 version. 
The music, concept, and delivery of it landed really well on me. That said, I imagine he'll probably struggle to hold up in later playthroughs once you know how to avoid being heard by the hero. With that said, I think he stands as a fascinating success not only within the game, but the series. I think the old hero deserves an A grade, and I wish more high concept boss fights like this had persevered into the rest of the series. Demon Souls often leans on the easier side with its boss fights than later entries in the series. A slower pace combined with limited movesets and a non-restricted healing pool can make it often difficult to die. Even with that though, the design and unique arena made every boss fight memorable and intentional in a way even later games in the series would struggle to do. The Dirty Colossus, however, is so comparatively bland and uninteresting that even though he functions better than the worst of the worst in the game, he poses no real threat and leaves no real impression. Now, I should say that that is a little disingenuous. His swings can hit hard, and his cannon that shoots fly swarms that deal persistent damage until you burn them off using the torches can put the player in a bad spot. But if you stand behind him, the only thing he can do is an AoE explosion, something incredibly easy to predict and punish. He can barely turn around, which means standing behind him is enough to win most of the fight on its own. I haven't talked about boss placement outside of the Adjudicator Strain's aesthetic, but level 5-2, where the Dirty Colossus lives, is a heavyweight contender for the single hardest level in the game. Damage is high, player mobility is at an all-time low, and Toxic and Poison are a constant threat. There are so many opponents stuffed into this level. Hell, this level is one of the only ones in the game that places a shortcut for its players, which means the developers had to know how brutal the level experience is. The Dirty Colossus, however, seems designed to be fought early on. It is such a baffling choice to put such a simple boss in an area that feels designed to be one of the last players will reach. To reach him, you even have to fight Leechmonger. Their places honestly feel swapped. The Dirty Colossus earns a D grade. Like I said, he does function better than the worst of the worst, but his moveset is too simple. Earlier, I mentioned the old hero was one of two bosses who overcharged the raw power of a boss to make a point in how the game wanted you to face it. The Dragon God, the first of the archdemons that we're discussing, utilizes the same strategy, but struggles to make it work as well as the old hero. The Dragon God, like the old hero, is a stealth fight, but where the old hero asks you to utilize mobility, open space, and equipment to avoid him, the Dragon God is a linear stealth sequence with hard-to-read animations paired with even more punishing attacks. In order to beat the Dragon God, you'll run along a hallway, destroying rubble as you do, until you set up a crossbow. After the first crossbow, you'll hop down, destroy some more rubble, and climb back up to hit a second crossbow. This will knock down the dragon's face, pinning it for you to run forward and attack its tooth until it dies. Now, a little bit of this works. The Dragon God's eyes are yellow and turn red when he sees you, but sometimes he'll attack the moment he sees you, whereas other times he'll roar and get angry before swinging. Unfortunately, when you're running between the first and second crossbow, you won't have a clear line of sight to him. So you can often be hit with a fire breath that frankly makes Medir feel impotent with little to no warning. The eyes being on the side of his head means that it's never clear when he is or isn't looking in your direction, which makes it feel like stepping into his view is the only option to proceed. Even at the end, not only is his tooth the weak spot for some reason, but his breathing can deal significant damage to a player. That is a hitbox that can one-shot a low health build. There is a more clear cinematic story to the Dragon God with the crossbows than similar fights like the Bed of Chaos with the fire orbs, but it also makes the fight feel bizarre. The Dragon God is just standing there with two crossbows pointing directly at him, and he doesn't do anything about them as you're shooting at him. He can destroy the arena, but god forbid he hurt his shiny crossbows. Dragon God also has the worst musical upgrade in the remaster. The original PS3 version is so uncanny, you feel the tension that exists within that song even while the fight fails. The PS5 version leans towards generic action music. It loses what little spark of atmosphere the Dragon God had. On top of that, the Dragon God is one of only three bosses foreshadowed prior to their encounter in the game. It is the boss 
ending the introductory cutscene. It is the boss that kills you if you beat the Vanguard in the tutorial. And this is all you get. Not a real fight, just a stealth mission where you press X twice, and then you press R1 on a tooth. Outside of the visuals, nothing in this fight works. It's not fun, it's not engaging, and there's nothing you can do that makes you feel like you outsmarted the game like in the old hero. The Dragon God earns in F grade, and again, considering this is the big boss foreshadowed by the game's introduction, it is a massive disappointment. I already mentioned in my Dark Souls 3 video that I've never been a big fan of PvP, so naturally the old monk isn't a fight designed for me as a player. In terms of design, it's fairly straightforward. You have a fight with a player who gains a regular homing soul mass spell, or you have to fight with a tankier NPC with the same buff. This playthrough, I did fight the NPC, but I've watched some PvP footage and noticed that this fight ends up feeling more in the favor of the player than half light did in Dark Souls 3, which I personally think is for the best. The goal of Demon Souls is to find and beat all five Archdemons, and the Old Monk is one of those demons. All the other Archdemons are these huge climactic fights, even the underwhelming Dragon God, but the Old Monk is far more understated. It is a puppeteered corpse, which is a really fun concept for a PvP encounter. The Invader is at a disadvantage here due to their lack of healing, but Demon Souls' characters, particularly in a spirit form that a lot of new players will be in, have low enough health that it isn't impossible to rush someone down. This means that the more advanced Invader has the task of putting out enough aggression to stop the player from having a moment to pause, whereas the player will always win if the Invader is trading damage or trying to play defensively. I think this dynamic works a lot better in the less tanky Demon Souls than it did in Dark Souls 3, where characters can often take plenty of hits. The lack of additional enemies helps with the PvP fight, but the NPC version of this fight, which is what I have footage of here, is underwhelming. He has more health, but his moveset has the opposite problem of Half-Light, having not enough that's capable of threatening the player. The Old Monk uses claws, but no attacks that close the distance and absolutely no poise. Though it means he never feels as cheap and frustrating as Half-Light, it means he also fails to ever feel threatening. I do prefer not feel threatening to feeling frustrating, but neither of them are good design. It's hard to give the Old Monk a grade due to my own aversion to PvP, but considering the Old Monk built the foundation, it's bizarre that I prefer this to the Redux version in Dark Souls 3. Personally, I'm gonna give the Old Monk a C grade. Though he's not astounding in any capacity, it managed to stand historically as a successful PvP experiment. The NPC fight would likely earn a D grade, but I'm going to give the whole encounter the same even C grade, just to keep the list organized. When discussing action game boss design, there are three main categories bosses can be sorted into, not just in From Software's titles, but boss design in general. Humanoid, large, and colossal. Humanoid bosses are around the same size as the player, usually demanding a faster reflex and boasting a more detailed, intricate moveset. Within the series, this is bosses like Gale, the Burnt Ivory King, and Artorias. Large bosses are larger than the player, but not unrealistically large. These fights are about positioning and learning movesets, with enemies often having AoE abilities that provide their primary challenge. These are things like Medir, Nishandra, or Manus. Colossal boss fights are too large to fight with a standard moveset, and are thus always battled via some sort of gimmick. A lot of times, the gimmick is making the colossal boss fight into a smaller sub-fight that has to be completed to take down the one big foe, but sometimes, the game decides to make a battle fully cinematic without further delineation, which is the case for the Storm King. He's a big manta ray, and he and his friends are going to throw crystals at you while they look dramatic in the sky. You can rely on your magic or on a quiver full of arrows, a task easier said than done since locking onto the king is often difficult, but the intended solution here is to find the Storm Ruler and use its extended attacks to take him and his friends out of the sky. Is the fight hard? No. Is the fight dangerous? Also no. Does the Storm King often take too long to loop around as he flies in his big circle? Yes. Is it still ridiculously satisfying to press a single button and watch a huge wave of wind cut through the sky and do a massive chunk of damage? Absolutely. I'm mixed on the fact that bows and magic can similarly complete the fight. On one hand, you can argue it robs a little of the cinematic nature of the battle, 
but it also allows for unique expression way past other cinematic fights in the series. There is a best way to beat the Storm King, but it is not the only way. This is technically true for fights like Yorm and the Ancient Wyvern, but Storm King makes way more allowances than either of those two did. I'd much rather fight the Storm King with arrows than I would fight the Ancient Wyvern with a greatsword. Overall, I think the Storm King earns a high B grade. I wish there was an escalation within the fight, or that the Storm King posed more of a threat once you had the Storm Ruler, but this is still an incredibly exciting climax to an Archstone. From a gameplay standpoint, Maiden Astraea is a glorified NPC battle. Assuming that you even bother fighting her normally instead of just standing at the top of the arena and shooting arrows at her. As a gameplay encounter, it's underwhelming, one of the easiest in the game. But as a boss encounter, Maiden Astraea is the first battle that this series' iconic storytelling really rears its head. When you enter, Astraea is sitting in a pool of toxic blood surrounded by corpses. One of the corpses stands up and completely wordlessly marches to stop you. As you move towards him, Astraea asks you to leave, to give up your hunt. There is nothing for you here. But you can't beat the game unless you earn her soul. So you have to fight through Garl Vinland, her servant, and kill a healer. The arena for the battle with Garl Vinland is restrictive, almost two-dimensional. With Garl's heavy hammer and shield working so well in this environment, the player is encouraged to play a little cheesy. Dart in and out of combat, landing only a single hit as you do, or sneak behind it and chain backstab to backstab to backstab. The end result of this, though, is that it lets the player feel scummy while giving the time to let that atmosphere sink in or to force the player to murder Astraea from a distance, which honestly feels even worse. As I mentioned, the atmosphere is what makes this fight so special. The fifth Archstone is often talked down upon, and rightfully so off the level design. The levels are atrocious. But when you reach the end of this area, often frustrated and exhausted by the poison swamp, you're met with a human woman and her bodyguard trying to calm the dead and the impaned souls trapped in this hellhole it creates an incredible contradiction with the prior level. Though both the soundtracks are effective here, the edge does still have to go to the original. The remaster may have more expressive vocals and instrumentation and be more musically satisfying, but the repetition found in the original creates such an uncomfortable feeling that the remaster loses by nature of being more musically complex. When Garl Vinland dies and you march down to Astraea, she tears her own soul out of her body and demands you take it. Because after all, you came all the way here. That's what a monster like you wants. It is an incredibly powerful moment in a game that doesn't boast too many of them. This is my favorite fight in Demon's Souls and the first S-grade fight in the series. It sets the precedent for emotional battles like Gwyn, the Great Grey Wolf Sif, the Soul of Cinder, and introduce the concept of dialogue echoing in the player's ears throughout the fight, like in Osiris, and almost every memory Sekiro battle. Astraea may have simple to no gameplay, but whereas Artorius is the seed that the gameplay of the series evolved from, Astraea is the seed of story and emotion that makes this spiritual series of games something more than spectacle. Before there was Godfrey, there was the Dragon Slayer armor. And before there was the Dragon Slayer armor, there was Velstat. Before there was Velstat, there was Artorius. But when I said he was the seed, that wasn't quite right. Demon's Souls introduced the series' first big armored knight, the granddaddy of everything that followed. The Penetrator, which is a terrible name, but he has a cool introduction cutscene and he's historically one of, if not the most important fights in the series, so I'm gonna give him a pass. Most fights in Demon's Souls, as I mentioned near the start of this game, rely on some gimmick, some twist to make them stand out. A weakness to fire, needing to knock them down, clone mechanics, weak spots, healing, special conditions, being blind. The Penetrator and the boss that follow him are the two exceptions to that rule, and in that way, they are the boss designs that persisted the most in the series proper. In the case of the Penetrator, his moveset is focused on jumps, dashes, long sweeping attacks, and lunges. Moves that we saw in Elden Ring almost two decades later, forming the basis of everything in the game. With that said, the Penetrator utilizes his moveset in a really interesting way. In later fights in the series, enemies will often jump backwards to reset tempo, 
whereas the Penetrator is leaping both in and out of combat with almost every attack, mimicking the optimal hit and run style that two handing a weapon in Demon Souls pushes players into. In some ways, you can even see the elements that eventually formed Gascoigne, Maria, and German as how they amplified the player's moveset can be traced down here to the Penetrator and his Greatsword. On top of that, as anyone who's played Elden Ring can tell you, acrobatic mobile bosses very much became the norm as from software's design team developed, and that acrobatic trend started all the way back here with the Penetrator. You may have noticed throughout this video, but the general melee loop I ended up using against most fights was getting in some attacks, backing up, using positioning to dodge if I could, dodging if I couldn't, and then repeating that. I used this on everything from the Vanguard to the Penetrator himself, and the Penetrator, despite being twice the player's size, felt like he was using the same strategy with the advantage of a 12-foot long magical stabbing machine that he uses to penetrate clowns. The role here also works better than it does in most fights. The size and color of the greatsword makes the swings clear to read, and the Penetrator, more than other bosses in Demon's Souls, focuses a lot on telegraphing an attack. He'll reach a point pose and attack quickly, meaning the less powerful roll is easier to time here compared to longer lasting hitbox like the Armored Spider and Flame Lurker. Though lacking the emotional impact of Astrea, and often overshadowed in terms of detail of moveset by later games in the series, the Penetrator is an astounding accomplishment in boss design for how early in the system he was created. I honestly think that he deserves an S grade, and though Astrea is my favorite fight, Penetrator was mechanically my favorite duel. The fundamentals of this fight work to create an incredible dance. He's satisfying to dodge, and his moveset has this sense of natural momentum that other fights later in the series struggled to match. Though False King Alot may not be the final boss in Demon's Souls, he feels designed to be the last demon the player will likely take down. He's built up much more than other bosses in the game. As I mentioned in Dragon God, there are only three, being Dragon God, Maiden, and Astraea, and the False King Alant. Unlike Dragon God and Astraea, King Alant's name reappears constantly throughout NPC quest lines and item dialogue. Much like the Penetrator, he doesn't come with a loophole gimmick. He is a dude, he's got a sword, and he's gonna stab you with it. There are three things that set him apart from the Penetrator. First, though he has a shorter range, each of his attacks create long-distance wind effects that deal a smaller amount of damage to the player at a longer range than the Penetrator did. This fight works really well as a final challenge, since it makes the usual strategy of positioning out of range much more difficult than other fights, while still not being unrealistically punishing like Flame Lurker's AoE effects. Secondly, he has a grab attack that drains a level if it hits you, just takes away your entire last level up, that stat is gone now. I am not a big fan of this, because it punishes the people who are struggling, rather than providing a unique threat within the fight itself. Alternatively, I wish they had provided a stacking damage debuff, where we deal 5 or 10% less damage with all of our attacks, or a 10% health debuff that removes upon death or resting. That could still give the feeling of being drained of power without being as prohibitively punishing to struggling players. If losing to a boss enough means that you've been drained of power for future attempts, that means the game is pushing you towards grinding, making the immersive world that Demon Souls works so well to create start to fall apart. Finally, he has what I think is the absolute funniest AoE in the From Software library. He starts to charge this huge wind pulse, and y you know what, I'm just gonna show you, in real time, how long he takes to get this thing off. There he goes. He's charging. So not only do you easily have enough time to stroll across the whole arena, but he can also be staggered out of this attack with one or two swings. This means this is in contention for the single least threatening attack in the entire game, which I think is absolutely hilarious considering it is the not quite final boss's big threatening dramatic attack and you can just slap him a couple times or walk to the other side of the arena if you don't want to. Beyond those notable beats, his basic swordplay is solid. He attacks in faster flurries of attacks than the Penetrator, often swinging three to five times in a single combo. There's a satisfying feeling of impact that the wind does add to each of his attacks, but it also means that the damage occasionally feels too low, which is a bit strange, considering that usually Demon's Souls has the opposite problem. I also blatantly lied to all of you. This is not False King Alot, this is Old King Alot. 
The game will only reveal this is the False King a lot when you encounter the true final boss, and if you didn't save False King a lot for last, that twist will definitely lose a bit of its gravity. With everything considered, Alant is still a really solid battle. I may not like his grab and I find his AoE disappointing, but he still earns an A grade for how detailed and exciting the rest of his moveset is. There's a reason that the classic humanoid combat of Penetrator and Full Skin Alant stuck around into the series proper. It's really fun to fight and it makes the combat system come together in a really exciting way. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know where to start with this one. True King Alant is an ooze that can't put up a fight and tells you that no one likes the state Boletari is in, which yeah, I kinda gathered that between all the demons everywhere and the violence and everyone being dead and or depressed. Outside of the twist that King Alant was not, in fact, that windy boy, the fight against True King Alant didn't make me feel anything. You follow the Maiden in Black down to this arena to lull the Old One into slumber. The options at the end of the game are to lure the Old One to sleep and save the world, or you take the Old One's power and be an evil dude. And like I said, outside of learning that this is what happened to Alant for his hubris, this fight doesn't add anything to the closing moments of the game. He is another health bar you drain, you don't feel guilty because this whole thing was his fault. So I don't know why he's even fighting back here, not that he really puts up much of a fight. And I don't think his speech is going to make anyone change their mind, so with no real gameplay, no emotional impact, frankly, if he wasn't in the arena, I don't think I'd even have noticed. I don't know what the designers wanted me to feel here, maybe sad, maybe pensive. I think they wanted this to be more contemplative, but what he says feels so disconnected from the Maiden in Black speech that it took me a while to even know what he was talking about when he started monologuing. I feel bad giving him such a low grade, but I can't justify anything but an F grade. Maybe I just didn't get this one because I love the trope of an easy boss to make the player doubt themselves, Astray is proof of how well one of those can work. But the true King Alon didn't make me feel anything. And with Demon Souls analyzed, we have now explored all three Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and their grandfather. All that leaves in this spiritual successor of series is the absolute beast that is Elden Ring and its roster of 161 boss fights. I also, before I dive into that, want to do an errata video because there have been a ton of really helpful and informative comments on the videos, correcting a lot of small details that I either messed up or fully wasn't aware of. So I'll probably be putting that out next while I finish the script for Elden Ring. For Elden Ring, that video is 100% going to be multiple parts. Bloodborne and Sekiro were beasts of videos to edit with just under 60 fights and we have almost triple that coming up. So after the errata video, I'm gonna be diving into the first of what I imagine will be three parts of the Elden Ring boss analysis. I do already have a couple of other boss analyses and challenge videos already planned afterwards as well. I've been playing Lies of P, I've been doing a challenge run of Hollow Knight, plan to dive into that, so I'll be getting ready to set up those as I wrap this beast of a series up. But if you have any other Souls likes, or any other games that put in heavy emphasis on boss design, feel free to put those in the comments. I'm always happy to look for new games to play, and I'm excited to see where this series goes afterwards. Which means that I should probably bring up something that I haven't brought up yet. At the time I'm recording this video, we're only about 150 subscribers, off from 2,500, and considering I put out the first couple of these videos when I had 20 to 30, this has done way better than I ever thought it would. The amount of positivity in the comments has frankly been incredible. Of course there's been the odd hate comment here or there, but it's YouTube, I was going in expecting that. The amount of intelligent analysis and back and forth discussion that's been happening has been really cool to see. So appreciate all of you a lot for that and for sticking around. And I hope that even once we finish Elden Ring, you'll still stick around for whatever it is this channel ends up becoming. Either way, thanks for joining me on what is by far the easiest of this set to edit. And I'll hope I'll see you again as we dive into Elden Ring.